Hi, y'all. And now for something a little bit different. In this video, I'm going to talk about a line that gets bandied about quite a lot in political debates, and it is the proposition that my first duty as an elected official is to see to the safety of the American people, or whatever level of government uh, is relevant. Uh, this is just not the case. It is one thing that politicians say to you in public that they run away from as quick and, and as hard as they can get away from it the moment something goes awry. So if you run into anyone who proposes that the government has a duty to protect you or whatever it is, send them this video so I can explain how this really works, or more particularly, how it really doesn't work for them. And it's not me; it's not just me saying this. I'll just go through some court cases here, uh, two in particular. Anyway, so the politician or the gov government official will say in public, you know, on the uh, press conference or whatever, oh, our first obligation is to protect and serve the safety of the public, blah, 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 blah. But when something goes awry, they run into court with their lawyer, the government lawyers, uh, to argue exactly the opposite, that we have no obligation of any kind to protect anybody. Uh, this is what's known as Hornbook Law. It is a background principle that is, I don't know, goes all the way back into the mists of history, that the government actually has no duty to protect any citizen. And except, except in special cases, like if they chain you to a wall, then they have some obligation to protect you if someone comes in trying to get you because they have disabled you from being able to protect yourself. Anyway, the two cases I want to talk about that are uh, relevant here, well, many, but anyway, two in particular, are two Supreme Court cases, one of which is called DeShaney versus Winnebago County Department of Social Services, and the other is called uh, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez. These are absolutely dreadful cases. They're horrible. One of the things that the justices do in oral arguments in the Supreme Court, and this happens in appellate courts, uh, hot benches all over the place, is that they try to push the lawyers uh, as far as they can go to see what the limits of their arguments actually are. And uh, so anyway, uh, from the DeShaney case, uh, for if you don't know, there's a boy named Joshua DeShaney who had a father who was a very, very abusive asshole and beat this child uh, relentlessly. So the child was taken away from the father and then by the state and, and then given back to the father by the state and the father then proceeded to beat the living shit out of this kid so bad it brain damaged him and he's lived in an asylum since the 1980s. His estate sued uh, the, the state for its negligence in turning the boy back over to the father knowing that the father was going to do this to him or for having good reason to believe that the father was going to do this to them uh, to him. So they get into court and uh, it makes its way to the Supreme Court where the, uh, the government's position is that <laughs> no obligation at all. So uh, Justice Stevens proposes a hypothetical to the government's lawyer. So assume after having done that, taken the kid away from the father, uh, putting him in the hospital for treatment, the hospital now learns if we return the child to his father and the father has a knife and is about to abuse the child with the knife, do you say the state can go ahead and return the child? Uh, Mark Mingo says, Although that is certainly not the case before the court, in that instance, I believe from a constitutional standpoint, only a county or a department of social services could return the child without facing liability. In other words, the only people who could knowingly turn a child over to be murdered is the government. You do it. You get to go to the who's cow. They're immune. Uh, Justice Stevens again. Even with the knowledge that there's, even with the knowledge of extreme danger and almost certain serious abuse of this kind, Mark Mingo, even with that knowledge, Your Honor, and I have to say, I'm, I'm saying this a little bit more emphatically than the lawyers in these cases do because they realize the import of their propositions and so they tend to get a little bit quieter and like, yes, that's true. Yes, I would stand here and argue and the government is fully entitled uh, not to be held to account for these kinds of things and none of the, none of the officers. Anyway, so uh, Justice Byron White pipes up and says, and under your theory, I take it, if two policemen see a rape and watch it for their own amusement, no violation, uh, Mr. Mingo, we would concede there is no, uh, no constitutional violation in that particular case. Justice White, you're not, you're arguing it as well as conceding it. Laughter throughout the court. So uh, that was, I'm not going to go over the legal particulars. Uh, this was a constitutional challenge, but it comes up under different statutes and different guises. So I'm just giving you the overarching uh, legal reasoning. So uh, a couple of decades go by. And then the Castle Rock case happens. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez had a restraining order against her very abusive husband to protect her. Protect her. Um, just in case you're wondering, pieces of paper don't actually protect you. Just FYI. <clears throat> uh, but she had a restraining order uh, from, issued by a court. And um, to restrain the husband from contacting her or her children without, I think, supervised visits. And the husband abducts the three children uh, in violation of the 
the, uh, the restraining order. So Ms. Gonzalez, restraining order in hand, calls the police to follow, uh, to, to seek vindication of what the law on paper claims she's entitled to. Uh, the, there was a, um, in Colorado, there was a, a so-called mandatory arrest statute, which, by the way, is a complete misnomer. There is no such thing as a mandatory arrest statute. The police cannot be forced to effect an arrest. Uh, and so uh, you had that statute, and then on the back of the, the restraining order, for violations of it, it, it mandated that the police take action, which you can't force the police to take these kinds of action. So uh, the police show up, they listen to her very, very calmly, and uh, you know, then they just gave her a shuck and jive their, where their real policy is, fuck it, we don't do restraining orders, you're on your own, have a good day. I mean, don't call us, we'll call you. So she calls back. She wants her three children. Uh, the police keep, you know, oh, sorry, we don't do this, uh, call us back and let us know if anything happens. If we hear anything, we'll let you know. Well, later that night, they recovered the kids, and they called Miss Gonzalez. Uh, this, the kids went missing in the afternoon. They called her about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. I can't remember the particular details. To say, hey, good news, we've got your kids. The bad news is your husband murdered all three of them, came to the police department, dropped their bodies off, and then got in a gunfight with us. So if you'd like to collect your dead children, uh, they'll be at the morgue, and you can pick them up in three days at your convenience. Have a good day now. Click. So uh, a lawsuit <laughs> came in the wake of this. Um, so here's the government lawyer in the Supreme Court uh, starting off with his argument first. Respondent's claim has to be evaluated in light of the fundamental background principles that private citizens lack a judicially cognizable interest in arrest and in prosecution of third parties. These are, these are, this is Hornbook law. No citizen has a cognizable interest in having any law enforced, in having anyone arrested for doing anything to include raping and murdering their children. You have no interest in that at all. Uh, you have no interest in being protected by law enforcement. You have no interest in being having the borders defended from invasions. And you have no interest in, say, the fire department showing up and, and uh, putting out and dousing the flames on your, on your home. The most that you have is an expectation that they'll try for some people somewhere, though not maybe you. And uh, so he goes on. And that executive decisions not to enforce criminal statutes are presumptively beyond the scope of judicial review. Not only are they presumptively beyond it, they're just beyond it. Uh, anyway, well, I think the rule that the court uh, could create is that in a criminal context, which is all that is at stake here, there is a background presumption that individuals lack a judicially cognizable right to arrest or prosecution of third parties. I mean, I guess maybe you have some right in having yourself arrested. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, for example, an arrest warrant. Although there is some question about whether or not that really is mandatory, uh, I'll address that in a minute, there's no question here, but back to what he says, it's certainly couched in mandatory terms. It's directed to the marshal. To the marshal, you are hereby commanded to arrest Jane Doe or whoever. But there is a very established body of law that even people who basically agitate for the arrest warrant don't have a grounds to complain if the arrest warrant isn't executed. At the federal level, there is a Leak versus a Timmerman, where the court held there is no protective interest uh, or there is no cognizable interest in the arrest of another party. And at the state level, there is a case, uh, there's a lot of case law indicating that officers are not liable to private citizens for a failure to execute arrest warrants or to enforce any other law. So the, the justices are giving them hypothetical after hypothetical. You know, say you call you. Um, you know, you're, you're about to be raped or you call for help because you're being raped but the cops show up because they like that sort of thing and they just sit there and watch. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Or no liability. Yeah, no liability. The cops are immune. City, you know, whatever. The, not, the citizen has no interest. And in, uh, even if the cops show up, they have no interest in the cop actually lifting a fucking finger to help them in any way. Uh, so long as the officers don't encourage the behavior or put the person in the situation uh, where they can't defend themselves or make the situation worse for the person, you, as a private citizen, have no interest of any kind in being unraped if a cop is nearby. They can stand there. They can even videotape it if they want to. And uh, there, there's no legal problem there, no matter what the law says. As in, in the, uh, the Castle Rock case, they brought up that, yeah, well, you read the language of the statute, and it says, the officer shall do this. But when it comes to the government, shall doesn't mean shall. Shall means may or is suggested, whereas when there's a law that applies to you, unless there's an exception written into the law, uh, when it says you shall do this, it means that you are obligated on pain of arrest or some kind of punishment to do it, where for executive officials, not so much. Anyway, 
the on the the warrant having a, a warrant and whether or not uh, that's mandatory this isn't open to question it, it's so so accepted is it uh, going back into the mists of history that um, executive officials are free to ignore this that is built into the NCIC for those of you who don't know I'm an ex-cop uh, it's built into the NCIC when you do something called locate a warrant you know you run across a person who has a warrant for his arrest, and uh, so long as you meet the conditions of the warrant, which is to say you're within the extra, extradition zone, and the the agency that entered the warrant into the system refuses to extradite the person, you you when you locate the do what's called locating the warrant, you put in a no extradition note, and if that ever happens on that file again, and this happens quite commonly, so common is it, it's built in to do it automatically, that if another uh, another agency stops the same person, arrests the same person, whatever. And the agency who issued the who has who's responsible for executing the warrant says we're not we're not going to execute that warrant. It's automatically purged from the NCIC. The file is retired because they're not executing. And this happens day in and day out because executive officials are free to go. Yeah, that's a very nice warrant. Thank you for it, Judge. Uh, have a good day. Uh, a great example of the executive's ability to ignore various kinds of supposed affirmative obligations. It, it, it comes from what the different branches of government are tasked with doing. The, the Congress, ha the legislature has the power of the purse, the executive has the power of the sword, he's got his own army, and the courts have the power of judgment. You know, they can write opinions. And as Andrew Jackson said in an opinion issued by the Supreme Court, they've issued their, <laughs> they have issued their order, let us see them enforce it. It's just a practical consideration that, you know, when the executive has the army and you have a quill you're not going to show up and go, well, you know, uh, Mr. Executive, I've got my quill. I'll tickle you into submission. It just doesn't work. Anyway, uh, so there, there's no obligation, despite the fact that they will, these politicians will stand up and, and say, my first duty is to see to the safety of the American people. Uh, they tell, I think I've already said this, they tell the citizens that on national television, on the radio, in debates, and then whenever... They get called on it, they run into court with high-powered lawyers to argue not only is there no obligation, but f further than that, you as a citizen have no reason to expect that the government would do anything to help you. And now, if you, wanna, if you want welfare benefits, there is a right to that, uh, but not to be protected by the cops. Now, this isn't to say that the cops are bad. This is just a very practical consideration that if the government so somehow became liable for every crime it was unable to stop, it would immediately go bankrupt because of all the lawsuits, if you think about all the crimes that are committed that aren't stopped by law enforcement. And so it's just a practical consideration that you can't get around. Anyway, um, another consideration is, it's a practical one, about the average ordinary everyday cop who really does want to help people. Unfortunately, there are these little things called the laws of physics. Uh, typically, when a call for service comes in, the officer's not standing in the next room just, you know, oh, I happen to be here. How lucky for everyone. I will rush in and save this person's ass. This happens in Hollywood. It doesn't happen in real life often. And by often, I mean almost never do the cops arrive in time to save your ass. Typically, the job of law enforcement, other than offenses that, that happen in their presence, traffic citations, things of that nature, or when they're doing surveillance for particular kinds of crimes, uh, putting that off to the side, so non non officer initiated contact uh, with respect to the crime, they uh, they show up after everything after all the dust has settled, uh, collect the evidence and go see if they can find the bad person, and then if they're inclined, arrest the person and take them to jail. But and you have no interest in forcing them to do that. But anyway, uh, they they really want to help, but as I mentioned, they're not right next door. So the call, you know, you say someone's just broken into your house. By the way, I don't know how long this video has been going on, but if you live in a large city, and when I started this video, if someone had broken into your house right when I started it, uh, they could have been murdering you this whole time, even if you had called the police right when I started this video, too. So, in other words, the, the would-be murderer breaks in, you call the police and turn on this video, or I suppose he turns it on after he's finished murdering you, he would have time to go make a sandwich and then leave before the cops arrived in most places, unless it's just one of those flukes. Anyway, uh, it, these data aren't hard to find. Uh, FBI puts out studies on this from time to time. Um, how often it is that the cops actually show up in time to save someone's ass. And it is not just rare, but almost never. So there was one study put out uh, by FBI 
in 2009 in one of their law enforcement bulletins. And in it, it was a survey, uh, it tracked uh, the careers of 2,000 some odd police officers who uh, had an av average time on the job of 12 years. And the, all the, the priority calls, so this isn't like my dog is, my cat is in a tree or there's a dog in my yard. These are 911 calls for serious crimes where uh, I need help now. Um, 14 million, 7,000 of those calls over, over the uh, span of time of this study. And these several, these couple thousand officers who, out of those 14 million some odd calls, were able to respond in a sufficient amount of time for it to have made any difference at all to the person who was being the victim of the whatever in under 2,000 cases. So it happened less than once per officer in half a career. So if you extrapolate that, I guess, at least in this study, the average officer there would have been able to show up in time to save someone's life in two calls in a career. Less frequently, by the way, than the officers in the study engaged in uh, gun incidents with, with criminals, with armed criminals. So, um, and, uh, but slightly more frequently than they wrap themselves around trees responding to these calls. So there's that. Uh, you're slightly, <laughs> you're slightly likelier, or wait, is it less like, oh, I can't remember the, the numbers now. The, the numbers are very close. It's, it's a couple thousand incidents where the officers responding hit a tree or get in a car crash, as it is when they show up, and as it is when they engage in, in uh, gun battles with, with armed assailants. Those are, they're rare, uh, but it not, it's not something that you should bank on, that the cops are going to arrive in, in a sufficient amount of time to save your ass. You should more likely expect that the officer is going to be in a gun battle with an armed, crazed assailant, then he's actually going to show up and stop your child from being raped, stop you from being raped, or whatever. And you can listen to, if you have the kind of free time, you can go listen to 911 calls gone bad. Uh, there are thousands of these. And you'll hear um, the reality of a person who is about to be killed, about to be beaten, about, you know, all kinds of horrible things, you can hear the realization set in in these people's voices as they realize that they have completely misplaced their trust in the police, not any malicious intent on the cops, just practical considerations, and that their fate is now being dealt to them and no one is going to come save their ass. One in particular happened in Oregon, and this one is funny in a sick kind of way, Woman calls 911 because there is a man banging on her door trying to break in. Cops are busy. It happens. And uh, a, a home invasion was apparently not high on the priority list that night. So uh, the dispatcher asked the woman if she could go ask the criminal, the guy trying to break into her home, if he wouldn't mind just coming back later. That was the great defense. And so this woman's starting to realize she's fucked. He broke in, raped, and strangled her. But take heart, they caught him later and successfully prosecuted him, and he's spending the next, I don't know how many years, in prison for, uh, for his fun that evening. Imagine there you are, knowing there's an evil person outside of your home about ready to break in, and you call the police and essentially get laughed at and told that your best defense is to beg the person nicely to try again later, because I guess you're otherwise engaged. Anyway, uh... You, uh, you abdicate your own personal responsibility and believe politicians when they tell you this shit, potentially at the risk of your own life. So uh, don't take these claims at face value. Look behind it. Know what the law is. And by the way, I don't expect most citizens know these laws. Um, there is a sizable portion of the American population who think Judge Judy is actually on the Supreme Court. Have a great day.